Okay, um, thanks so again. My name is Christy Burdett, and um, just this summer I finished my um, master's in public communication and technology here at CSU, and my project that I worked on was a, um, this uh, research development and um, evaluation of a public outreach communication plan. Um, we focused on white nose syndrome, and it has been very fun. I've been really enjoying it, and so now I'm working at um, National Park Service. Um, so what we're going to go over today, um, we're going to talk very briefly about white nose syndrome, what it is, um, some of the communication challenges that we faced um, when dealing with this disease. I'm going to kind of briefly go over the kind of the research project and approach that we took um, toward this. And then um, finally, I'm going to have like a kind of a snapshot of how the different things that I learned we incorporated into the social media campaign that's going on right now that's Bat Week 2015. And then finally, kind of how we can apply this um, process to other natural resource issues um, at the Park Service. So um, you may or may not have heard of white nose syndrome. It is a um, fungal disease um, that has that affects bats. It's most likely introduced um, from Europe in the winter of 2006. Um, was when it was first kind of identified in a cave near Albany, New York. And since then, it has been steadily moving south and west. So it started in one isolated location um, less than 10 years ago, now is in 26 states and five Canadian provinces. So it is spreading, um, you know, at a very steady pace. And um, it, it doesn't affect all bats. There's about seven species of bats that are vulnerable to um, this fungus, uh, the Pseudogymnoascus destructans. Um, they're all cave dwelling, um, hibernating bats. Those are the ones that are um, susceptible to getting this disease. So that's what it is. And then you might be wondering, well, why, why does it matter? Um, well, it has been devastating to some bat populations. Um, millions of bats have died. Uh, up to 100% of some bat populations um, have, have died. Um, as of now, there have been 11 national parks that have positively confirmed the presence of either white nose syndrome or the um, fungus that causes it. But that doesn't really tell the whole story. I mean, yeah, 11 national parks, but all of the lands, you know, around surrounding them um, that, they, that they border that are adjacent um, are, oh, okay, sorry, um, are, are affected by the presence of white nose syndrome and this fungus. So additionally, many people um, probably already realize that bats do provide invaluable ecosystem services, whether it's pollination, seed dispersal, serving as prey themselves, or in the case of these species that are affected by white nose syndrome, um, they're insectivorous, meaning they eat insects, and they eat a lot of insects, and that is kind of a crucial aspect to uh, many ecosystems. So when I first started this um, project last fall, um, Kevin and Sarah, who I work with at NPS, um, had kind of outlined some communication challenges that they had already identified. Um, there are 408 different national park units, so each unit is um, has its own, you know, specific needs, um, specific uh, situations, and so there were a lot of different um, parks, a lot of different messages going on, um, and because of that, these parks would have different priorities. So the messages about white nose syndrome that were going out weren't, weren't always consistent because some things would be highlighted versus others. And then another thing that's challenging about this is that white nose syndrome is a fairly new disease and there's still a lot of research being done and a lot of updates. So um, it, that's a challenge as far as this disease goes in particular because it needs to be frequently updated. Um, things get pretty stale and old pretty quick. So um, the objectives of, our, of my project was really to develop a way that we could um, have consistent messages about white nose syndrome throughout the park we wanted to make it relevant to parks because, as I mentioned before, they each have very unique needs and situations. So we needed to make it relevant and easy for them to use and implement, and also developing a process for updating information about it. So um, in, in doing this and um, working with um, 
Sarah and Kevin um, kind of came up with a, a lot of different approaches that you could take to this issue. Um, communication um, based on environmental communication. There's also um, aspects of public relations that go into this as far as, you know, this is factual information that we need people to understand. Um, organizational communication, um, like I said, you know, 408 units, how, how are we going to kind of get everybody on the same page and, and talking to one another and, you know, sharing the same message. And then also interpretation um, going from like talking to parks to talking to individuals, um, you know, hoping that they could um, learn stuff from the interpretive interpretive programs in in order to kind of make changes like there is the common um tilden um quote i guess you would say that um through interpretation understanding through understanding appreciation and then through appreciation protection and this is kind of the idea of um that we're trying to get with bats if they understood the issues that we're facing bats and how important they are and they appreciate them then ideally they would make behavior changes to um, to conserve them. So um, in doing this, um, these are the questions that I asked um, because really wanted to find out how we could get this project going and successful. So in order to come up with the, the final objectives that we were looking for, which were consistent messaging, you needed to know what parks were saying. So what are the current messages? How are they communicating about white nose syndrome? And what are kind of the key factors that determine what they say about white nose syndrome and when or if or any of those things. So those kind of guided the research. Um, did uh, content analysis of news releases pertaining to white nose syndrome. The most fun part was the focus group interviews and I went to two parks and got to sit in a room with park personnel and really hear firsthand what what the disease meant to them and how they dealt with it and, and really kind of I felt like got some good information. And then also um, another content analysis of all of the different park web pages that mention white nose syndrome and really looking at what kind of messages are being said about it and um, the kind of tone that was being used for it. Um, some of the things that I found were, first of all, there were many messages and they were very different. Everything from white nose is bad to um, um, you you can help them, you can help bats, or the caves are closed, or any of those kind of basic things. But um, the tone and kind of the main idea on each page was, was pretty different. And again, it goes back to all the different situations of parks. Um, again, that there's different points of emphasis. Again, the problem with um, information being outdated, because it takes a lot of resources to keep information updated all the time on websites and things like that. Another thing that I found that was um, that was problematic was, or I don't know, kind of surprising, I guess, was that a lot of people weren't aware of different resources that they had available to them um, from natural resource stewardship and science to use. And also, a lot of the messages were very um, uh, explaining, yeah, um, white nose is bad, bat, or bats are in danger, you know, this disease is killing bats, they're dying, but it there wasn't a lot of information about what National Park Service was doing to help bats, what people could possibly do to help bats. There wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't any like steps that people could take. It was just kind of bad news. And then that's, that's not really helpful in getting people to make change if you don't offer any solutions. Um, so then also common communication techniques. Um, again, like I say, a lot of the resources that were available weren't used and a lot of the park materials were very well developed, but they were very idiosyncratic, you know, based on the, the needs of a particular park. There are some cool projects, and hopefully more and more um, parks will pick up on those. The adopt a bat at uh, Lava Beds, for instance, and the Bats Alive workshop at Indiana Dunes and Bat Night. So, you know, there there's a lot of cool stuff that is going on out there. Um, Probably the most important thing are the different factors that influence park staff. Um, if if you look at this, these are the things that I kind of, through all of the comparison and all of the research and analysis of the data, um, you can see that there's not a lot under under National Park Service. That wasn't like, didn't seem to be a big um, factor in like how people talked about white nose syndrome. Um, more, more importantly, it seemed where like the, the 
prior knowledge and the attitudes that visitors had when they came in, um, you know, how, like how they already felt about bats. Another crucial thing um, was just the different resources that parks have, you know, if it's a, a park out west, you know, with huge bison, those are much more interesting and much more visible. Not, I shouldn't say interesting, but just more visible. Um, it's hard to see bats thoroughly out at night. Um, so uh, those different things, you know, made a big difference on how park officials talked about white nose, whether it was important to them, and that really depended on um, the resources that the park had to offer. Um, so after doing all of that, kind of the recommendations that um, we came up with were that it's really important for the stuff to use platforms that are easy to update with all of the changing information. It needs to be easy to update. Um, the, uh, the available tools need to be promoted better, so there needs to be a little bit more effort in letting people know, which comes back to the number three, which is really, it was, it was it seemed obvious that there wasn't enough pushing of information, that a lot of times we relied on people to kind of seek out information about white nose syndrome. And, you know, people in parks have a lot of other, a lot of competing priorities and resources and things that they need to communicate about that if we're not really pushing that out, we can't rely on them to, I don't know, find spare time to look up information about white nose syndrome. So that was, um, kind of one of the crucial things. And then also developing um, tools that different parks could adapt. So where you could keep the messaging consistent, but parks would have the opportunity to um, kind of, uh, you know, be, be, so that the templates were flexible enough that they could adapt that information for their needs that would, you know, identify what they needed to talk about. So um, we developed this communication plan, it's a cute, that I think, um, and you know, real briefly, these were just the objectives that they put out, and, and these objectives were used as kind of a measuring stick throughout the whole project. You know, basically, again, a consistent messaging. Um, we want to demonstrate that in PA, that this is important to the National Park Service. That bat conservation is, you know, a priority, um, just like all of all of the other park resources, um, and that we're using, you know, the best available science to do that. Um, this was a message that was missing a lot in, um, throughout my um, research was that just how important bats are in ecosystems and, and kind of the kind of crucial role they play. Um, and finally, the last two were kind of objectives that dealt with park visitors that we ideally they would know what white nose syndrome is, um, you know, and these other things about conservation and then finally, that they have a clear idea of the steps they can take to help bats. Um, so these are just kind of some of the sample tools that we developed. Um, the point here being that, like, the, the decon card, that this is a really um, kind of complex issue, and so we we're trying to break it down into, um, simplify it into, like, three questions that could be easily used in all, in all different parks. Um, also, just to, this, um, the FAQs, this could be a, a potential for crowdsourcing to hear back from our visitors of questions that they have. Also an opportunity for people to um, put in information that's specific to their park or program or whatever. And then um, this is just parts of an interpretive handbook, um, just an example of all the different ways that we can use to communicate about white nose syndrome with different audiences. So using all of these stuff that we learned, um, we developed um, this uh, social media campaign for Bat Week, which is right now. It started on Monday, so happy Bat Week, everyone. Um, it has been kind of really exciting. This is the second one. Last year was the first one. Um, a little bit about it is it's um, put on by uh, several different agencies. This is an interagency group um, that really mainly works to promote or to um, deal with white nose syndrome. So it's not just communication. There's also um, like steering committee and biologists and all kinds of different parts of this organization of, and they're from different agencies to work on kind of this collaborative effort to deal with white nose syndrome. And so the communication committee um, developed this, the Bat Week. Um, and so the idea is just to promote bat conservation throughout the world. So 
It sounds really cool, but there are some challenges for a park service to um, participate in this. One is when I talked to um, people in parks last year, that week was just hard for them to deal with. Um, it's an off season for a lot of them, so that wasn't like they were going to have special programs or even have a lot of people coming in. They might have kind of like local visitors come in, but for a lot of them, it, it was kind of a not the best timing. Um, additionally, um, well, bats are just always kind of hard to see, so it's like that doesn't matter so much unless they have like rabies or something, which I'm sure Danielle will talk about in a few minutes. Or you know, if you can see a bat, you probably don't want to. You probably don't want to see a bat. Um, so, and additionally, the timing around Halloween it has the potential to reinforce kind of these um, negative stereotypes that a lot of people have about bats, that they're scary, that they're rabid, a lot of misconceptions that they're that they're vampires, you know, there's that they get in your hair, a lot of those kind of continuing those myths. So those are some kind of some challenges. I tried to find a really scary picture of a bat, but they don't, I don't know, I think I've looked at them too much. They don't seem that scary anymore. Um, but then you can also look at, this is a, a really good time. Um, it, there are some benefits to white nose com syndrome communication with doing the bat week. Um, number one is bat, people are already talking about bats or they're thinking about bats with it being Halloween. Um, with us, it's a way that a lot of parks can participate because you're not just talking about white nose syndrome. You're really talking about bats and developing um, a better kind of rapport for bats throughout the service. So it is an opportunity to kind of dispel myths and also at the same time to share really cool information about bats. There's been a lot of fun things on there um, on social media about about bats, and it also helps us demonstrate um, our commitment to bats and white nose syndrome research. Um, what I've been doing, which has been really fun, is I've had a lot of bat experts um, email me videos, and they've you know sent me quotes and pictures and all these kind of experience positive experiences they that they've had with bats, and so that has been. Um, really kind of fun. So this is a picture of a um, lesser long-nosed bat um, that was sent to me from Organ Pipe. And I, it's, I don't know if you can see the bat. It's really hard to see with that black background, but um, they pollinate um, agave plants. And um, so there are lovable and beneficial sides of bats as well. So um, what I did was I participated in the interagency group to get it going, and then we use every tool at our disposal at our disposal to um, push this information to parks to encourage them to um, participate. Um, we used you know internal articles. We did direct emails to bat experts. We you know emailed public information officers in the regions. We um, really tried to pull out all the stops um, on that. And then at the same time, like I was saying with the flexibility um, piece of it, we really tried to just give templates and suggestions just so like we'd like for you to, you know, provide these consistent messages or, you know, kind of stick, stick to these types of messages. But, you know, it's your park, your, your thing, you can do whatever you want. Um, and so we've had really a great, great time this week. So it's day three. Um, we're doing a lot of talking about the benefits of bats. So far, we've had 44 different parks participating in the social media program, which has been really exciting. And they're from all over, from Acadia to Yosemite. Um, so that has been really kind of cool. And um, it, it's fun, too, because the, the messages that are getting out there are really are a lot about the, the work that NPS <coughs> does to conserve bats and, and protect their habitats. And it, it really is a good platform to explain why they do that. Um, and then it's also cool because we get to hear from people in the public and what they say. And so, yeah, bats rock, but fossils rule. That was a picture of a bat fossil. I mean, the best of both worlds, I guess. Um, and then just other little quotes like cool action shot. And then, of course, there's there's several of, I've always been afraid of bats and I still am. You know, I can't help it. Or, you know, I saw a rabid bat on grandma's porch when I was little. And so I hate them, you know. So it's, it is kind of... Um, I think it'd be really cool to go back and look at all of that and see what exactly people were interacting with um, through social media. So um, I think that 
this has been really, really cool. And in the, the social media campaign is just a very small slice of the different things that we've been doing to communicate about white nose syndrome. But I just wanted to use that as an example because it's current, it's going on right now. And we were, or I was really trying to use some of the messaging and, and um, concepts that we learned um, from my research project to incorporate in developing the social media um, plan and, and whatnot. But I think that um, another thing is that this communication process can be used in a lot of other um, natural resource issues that are service-wide, like motorcycle noise, for instance, or invasive species kind of come to mind. But other, other ways where, you know, you kind of identify the objectives and then you look at the existing communication that's out there and kind of figure out, you know, do the gap analysis of like, what are people saying that we like? What are they saying that we don't? You know, how can we really work to get everyone on the same page? And then um, finally, I, th I feel like for all of this um, communication and, and uh, natural resource issues, w when you're dealing with so many different parks, that it really has to be flexible but consistent. So you have to um, give parks, you know, make it easy for them to stick to your message by making whatever you're using flexible enough for them to adapt to their needs. And then finally, and that's the next step of the white nose one is just really trying to evaluate the effectiveness. And I think we're going to have to do another round of like pushing information out. Um, so that is where we're at right now. So, any questions? Yeah, thanks, Christy. Well, um, while we transition, if anybody has clarifying questions, this would be a great time for clarifying. Yeah. So and for this, those on the line, we're doing clarifying during, questions. Uh, during bat week, mm -hmm. um, are a lot of the bats already in hibernation? So if, even if like the northern parks wanted to do something with bats, they would be available. Yeah, a lot of them would be. Mm -hmm. so or, there, or they or they've already migrated. Gotcha. Has there been thought of like changing the timing of bat week so that they can actually? Not so much, um, just because <clears throat> there's such an interagency kind of. Oh, there's, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Can you repeat the question too? Oh yeah, she just asked about um, if there was a possibility of changing the timing of bat week to make it so that it would be easier to have uh, kind of park programs about it. Um, since it is, it involves like USGS, USDA, uh, other like NGOs that are really all behind it. And so now that it's in its second year, it seems to be kind of um, set on the Halloween week. And I think there are some cool aspects, you know, some opportunities there if people are already thinking about bats, you know, that we can exploit a little bit. Yeah. Do you think that it might help to target your um, uh, your program to the parks that um, are more likely to have bats? Like, there's a lot of national park <clears throat> places that really aren't um, natural areas, or mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, and those are the ones that are kind of looking out for this kind of information and that and that cover it for sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, the question was about you know should whether it would be more beneficial to target um, parks with bats, and and definitely that it, that is the case. The um, especially ones with caves; those are kind of the big ones um, because that's where the risk of um, human introduced um, white nose fungus is um, most potential, I suppose. So yeah, that is the case, but nearly all parks have bats. And so the concern is that visitors go from one park to another. So they go to one park and they hear about bats. They may, as, as White Nose grows in the news, they may, you know, ask questions. And so it's kind of like if, if, if all the different parks have bats in some way, they need to have some way of talking about White Nose Syndrome. <coughs> All right, so that's actually a really good transition. So my name is Danielle Bike. I'm the One Health Coordinator um, for the National Park Service, which is a joint position between the Office of Public Health and the Wildlife Health Branch. And we're interested, um, we use basically bats and rabies as a way to talk about public health risk messaging about zoonotic disease, which are diseases that can be transmitted between humans and animals. Um, to really look at, you know, do we really know what we're saying with a lot of these messages? And this is work that was done as a collaboration between the National Park Service and Cornell University's Human Dimensions Group. Um, and it's something that we're interested in for several reasons. You know, zoonotic diseases are of special interest to the national parks because we have zoonotic diseases. You know, anytime you have people in close contact with animals, it's a potential risk. However, 
it's often a risk that is amplified beyond what is, is healthy or um, relevant to the risk itself. And it's a situation where this type of messaging and this type of event of uh, basically ballooned risk perception can have really significant impacts for conservation. So support for conservation is not a given, but it's a product of societal experiences and beliefs where experienced or perceived positive impacts of wildlife exceed negative impacts of wildlife. And society today is very different than it was 100 years ago when the National Park Service was formed. Almost 82% of the US population is urban. And according to the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, survey of the American public in 2011, only 4% of the US population considers themselves hunters today. And only 23% would consider themselves wildlife watchers of any kind. I mean, that's a, that's a really small percentage, particularly when you look at the fact that such a huge percent of people are living in cities and in urban centers, and they don't have a connection or any prior experience to wildlife. Couple on top of that, the fact that humans are taking over much more habitat today than ever. And there are a few wildlife populations that have rebounded from the levels they were at, at at the turn of the century when humans had really decimated them. And so this creates a situation where wildlife are suddenly becoming more prominent um, in people's backyards in some areas, but also probably more importantly in the headlines in people's newspapers. And these are some of the headlines that they're seeing. Well, these headlines might be based in truth. They're only part of the story and they're really scary. Beware this evil Dracula of the long grass. I mean, those messages are, are, are hype, you know, they're sensationalist. And what research has shown is this type of disease messaging, when it includes wildlife, something that people might not have any other context for, has really devastating consequences for conservation and for support for wildlife in general. Uh, there's, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of research done in this field, but a few different studies in a few different areas have shown that when people hear about disease in relation to wildlife, it decreases their tolerance and support for wildlife. In particular, uh, a study from Wisconsin and Michigan found that human health concerns from chronic wasting disease, which I'll point out here, is not a zoonotic disease. It's a disease that impacts wildlife decreased people's interest and participation in hunting in those areas where CWD had occurred. Similarly, there was a, a survey of a residential community in New York that listed disease risk from coyotes as a major concern for this community. Even though they had only had one rabid coyote in the entire state over the past 15 years prior to that survey. Additionally, um, a, a, a great survey of the community surrounding Cornell University, which it, you may or may not know has a relatively large deer population. Um, they've, they've really evaluated people's perceptions of wildlife over time, and they found that people are now listing concern for disease risk from deer in communities as, as a significant concern for them and a reason why they don't tolerate deer in their community anymore. Even though at the time these surveys were done, they did not have Lyme disease, chronic wasting disease, or tuberculosis, or basically any major disease, be it zoonotic or not, in that wildlife population. So basically, support for wildlife is, is inversely correlated with disease risk or dis concern for disease risk. Now, at the same time, there's another movement and another conversation going on about zoonotic disease, and that is this, this One Health movement or concept. One Health is the recognition that human health, animal health, and environmental health are all interconnected and, and really interdependent when you look at it. Um, and it, it's, it's a concept that is really relevant for us at the National Park Service because we truly have to think about these three when we do our work because it's our ability to conserve resources is dependent upon, you know, support for conservation. And, and we really do need to think about the way that, that humans interact with the environment in these national parks. But it's also a great opportunity to look at some of this disease risk and disease messaging to think about, can we do a better job? Can we put this into perspective so that we can decrease this heightened alert that maybe is disproportionate to the actual level of risk? And can we do this in a way that we can actually at least preserve support for conservation, if not even increase it? 
So our, object, our objectives of the study were to ask the questions, can we message about zoonotic disease risk of bat rabies without negatively impacting public perceptions of bats and conservation intentions? Basically, can we still talk about bat rabies, which is important to do because it is still a risk, but without decreasing support for bats? And then secondly, conversely, we want to ask the question, how do messages about the ecological benefits of bats, this so-called One Health message, influence public health message efficacy? Because what we don't want to do is have people say, oh, rabies isn't a concern and have them go out and potentially handle bats and not get medical evaluation afterwards if they had a risky exposure. So we did this by visiting four national parks um, from July through August in 2014 um, and interviewed visitors using uh, one of eight different message conditions and a no message control. So we gave them a designed message about bats and rabies, and then we followed up with a survey afterwards to gauge their support for bats, um, their, their general feelings about bats, and a few other things to evaluate the messages. And I'll go over the messages first. So we varied two aspects of the message in our first experiment, and I'm only going to cover the four, first four messages that we gave um, in, the influence, or in the interest of time. So first, as, as highlighted here in, in red, we varied the proximal nature of the risk. So basically, we said either a rabid bat was recently found in this area of the park, or we said that this park has had rabbit bats in the past. So that's the difference between the proximal message and the distal message. Basically, the risk is right here and now, or this is a risk that might exist, that has existed before. The second part that we varied is the addition of this benefits message. So we included a message about the important ecosystem services of bats and why we as humans benefit from having bats around. And for this part, we either included it or we excluded it from a message. And so this is the, the two by two table um, where we classified what the messages were. So basically messages one and two had benefits of bats and three and four didn't. And messages one and three talked about that proximal recent rabid bat while two and four talked about the distal rabid bat. We then asked questions about behavioral intentions around bat conservation and stewardship, um, intent to follow the public health recommendations. We still want to ask about, is this message still effective? Um, risk perceptions and self-efficacy. And then also we wanted to look at experience with and knowledge about bats. Maybe people just had a, a bad experience with bats previously, and that's going to override any message we could give them. Then we also evaluated the message quality um, to see if people felt it was clear, informative, or persuasive to try and get at why they changed their opinions based on the message. We assigned belief scores of, of one, which was strongly disagree, to five, which was strongly agree, and then averaged those composite scores. We used a chi-score test across demographic variables to test for randomness, and then also um, across mean scores for each question to look for differences. We also did an ANOVA, um, an analysis of variance, um, to basically look at you know, what factors were most important, um, if we could model disease risk and perceptions. And then we also did a mediation analysis um, using the process macro addition to SPSS to try and get at why people felt those messages were, were better or, or what the mechanism of action was. So basically, um, the demographic variables were just what you would expect from a park. And this is something that's a limitation of our study. Um, you know, people that visit national parks are largely older and more educated and unfortunately less diverse than the average American public in general. And so that's, that's a limitation of our study. But we did find that our survey participants matched what we would expect from the national park visitors as a whole. First, we asked the question of, of tolerance of bats. You know, would people still allow bats to use the outside of their residence after reading these messages? Um, and, and you can see at the very bottom, we have the no message control um, and then the mean scores. Again, five is agree and one is disagree. And for messages one and three, which are the messages that had that proximal, recently there was rabies in this area, um, people were less tolerant of bats. And similarly, it was still messages one and three that showed decreased intent to write letters in support of a park or a natural area. So when you talked about this risk as being right there, very proximal and in the present tense, people were less likely to still tolerate or support bats. 
We also asked about feelings of self-efficacy because if you're familiar with the model of risk perception, if, if something is controllable or if you have either personal or societal efficacy over something, people have lower risk perceptions relative to the actual risk itself. And we found that when you included that benefits, that One Health ecosystem services message about bats, people felt that they were they were more they had better self-efficacy that things were more avoidable, which is a good message and something that we really want people to know because we have very safe and effective biologics around bat rabies. It's definitely a risk, but it's an extremely small risk that we can adequately manage and respond to with public health services. And so we really do want people to feel that this is a, a very avoidable risk. So this was a positive outcome from our perspective. Um, and this is just, I guess, conclusions from that per first portion of our study. But I also want to get into the analysis of variants, because I think this is where some of the really important communication messages come in. Uh, when we included benefits of bats in the message, this significantly increased intentions to follow public health recommendations. And what this tells us is that contrary to what some people think, when you include this, this separate story, aside from that basic core public health message, it actually increased the efficacy of your public health message. It was really truly a win-win situation for conservation and for public health. And this is really counter to what we're taught as public health professionals about communication, something I'll get to later. We also did this media mediation analysis where traditional messaging might look at, you know, does X influence Y, but we added in this interaction term, M, to look at how, you know, is it the informativeness, is it the clarity, or is it the persuasiveness of your message that means Y will lead to, or excuse me, X will lead to Y. And we did find a very significant relationship here. Um, one asterisk is a 0.05 level, um, and three is 0.005 level. So we, we did find that, you know, if you, if you look there, it, <clears throat> perceived informativeness explains almost a quarter of the reason why people were willing to tell a, bar a park ranger about a strangely behaving bat, which was our outcome of interest from the public health perspective. So basically, including a One Health message on the ecological benefits of bats increased the adoption of public health recommendations because people found it informative. It's, it's a basic story that works for a lot of communication, you know, that, hey, if you tell an interesting story, people are more likely to listen to you. Engagement may improve messaging outcomes. This isn't surprising. I mean, how many of you paid more attention to this slide because it has a pretty picture of a deer on it? But it's something that's very counter to what we as public health professionals are taught. We're taught to, to have a very short, very to the point message and fear is often used as an operative to get people to pay attention to you. And what we found in our study here is that if you tell some, an interesting story, people are more likely to listen to you and they're more likely to remember what you tell them and take it home. And I think this is really exciting for a lot of what we do about One Health and zoonotic disease messaging and it has a lot of really important implications for conservation. We do have some really important next steps though. Um, there's obviously some limitations to this study. First and foremost is that this is one form of messaging. And as, as we know, and as Christy really well pointed out, there's lots of different forms of messaging used in parks and in public health education campaigns. So we need to make sure that this format works for other message sources as well. Uh, secondly, we, we also need to look at different types of populations. You know, we're looking at a very specific national park population, but how does this apply to the U.S. population as a whole? Um, and can we generalize this and can the public health community take these findings to use it in their, you know, state and local health department campaigns as well? And second, you know, we really want to increase the awareness of the potential positive impacts of One Health messaging, because I think the National Park Service has done a really great job of, of looking at this interaction between human, animal, and environmental health. And I think we can have a really big impact on the broader community of public health as a whole that hopefully could, could help parks and land management agencies out across the United States. And that's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you.